you haven't heard, the Cathedral Park Dock in North Portland is getting a major upgrade, and you're invited to come along for a free party on Saturday, June 29th to celebrate its grand reopening. The Human Access Project is hosting a Cathedral Park River Fest where you can dance to live funk and soul music while enjoying free swimming lessons, kayak rentals, that's pretty cool, and a life jacket giveaway. There will also be food vendors and community booths, so come on and join the party on Saturday, June 29th from 2 to 8 p.m. and experience the revitalized Cathedral Park waterfront. It's going to be awesome. I'll for sure be there, probably jumping off the dock. For longtime listeners of the show, you know Eater Portland editor Brooke Jackson Glidden has been with us since the very, very beginning. From food cart drama to the best Italian food to how to nail a depression meal to where to eat in Beaverton. She's brought us the very best of our city's food scene, but after six years as editor of Eater Portland, she's off to lead Portland Monthly as its new editor-in-chief. So today on CityCast Portland, we're conducting an exit interview of sorts to get Brooke's hottest takes on our food scene, as well as her all-time favorite and least favorite dishes that she's eaten while on the job. It's Monday, June 24th. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. When I read the news that you were moving on from Eater, I was like, of course, excited for you. But I was also like a little sad because it just felt like the end of an era. And like, I didn't even work there. And I felt that for you. How are you feeling about it? I am feeling everything. I'm feeling definitely really sad to be leaving the team there. And I feel such weird feelings about like building my whole life around being a food writer and then not doing that for the Mm -hmm. first time in a real way. I'm also super, super excited to do something new to get back in print. I love print, like holding a thing with Mm -hmm. words in it. And I'm also like nervous because it's something that's so different from what I've been doing for the last six years. So it's a cocktail of things, I guess. Yeah. It, there's also like a little part of me that is selfish because I knew it would mean that you're moving on as one of our main food contributors because you're going to possibly be focusing on different things since your day to day isn't going to be immersed as deeply as it was in our food scene. But now that it isn't. What is your hottest take that you couldn't share about the Portland <laughs> food scene until now? Let's burn every bridge, Brooke. Oh, Let's do no. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, it doesn't have to be negative. You know what I mean? It's a hot take. Yeah. That's such an interesting thought. Um, I will say that people have really fascinating parasocial relationships in Portland with um, chefs. So like there is an element of like defensiveness and protectiveness of chefs among our readers that I always thought was really, really interesting in a way that I don't see in the same way in other markets. When you're in other cities, especially cities like London, where there are these like big media markets um, around food, there's this element of like people say whatever they want and like chefs maybe are salty about it. But like there's just this element of like who cares? You know what I mean? Saying whatever you want. In Portland, I would regularly get calls because a chef or a restaurant that's on like five of our last maps isn't on the sixth. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like an omission feels like a real slight and not just for the chef, but like for the fans of the restaurant, it was there was a lot of major defensiveness and almost like a a weird, I don't want to say uncalled for. I mean, like, It just didn't seem reasonable, possibly. Yeah, and I I think also the chefs weren't necessarily looking for it. Yeah. But people would defend these restaurants in a way that would sometimes involve, like, hate speech (laughs) or, like, like, you know, going really for the jugular in certain ways. And it's like, I remember kind of going, is this, like, how it is to be a food writer everywhere and like talking to other eater editors not really (laughs) cool just portland we are like very protective of our food scene and i think that like in certain ways that creates a really cool sense of camaraderie among among chefs here and among the food community here people even who just dine out quite a bit but also it is sort of a funny thing compared to places again where there's just like a culture of 
very little self-editing among like food writers just because it's like people say whatever they want and it's almost white noise because of the size and and scale of the market. Could I ask if you have any theories as to why? Because I have one. Ooh, interesting. I think Portland views itself as a small town in many ways. And Mm -hmm. there is a a level of protectiveness that comes from like these people feel like my neighbors and like community. Yeah. That's my theory too. It's it's like, it's because I feel like even though we are growing here in Portland, when people open up a restaurant, it's rare that they're trying to be like otherizing. I made this restaurant. You look up to me. You eat my food. It's more like I want to be part of your community. I yes. want you to be part of my community. We are exchanging in this even level, which I feel like doesn't happen in other cities that I've experienced. It's just like, here's an eatery. Enjoy it or not. Yeah. I think that is something that's very special about this city is just how connected people are and how chefs are really um, collaborative. There is a real interest in, in supporting each other. It's far less competitive in the way that you will see in many, many other cities. And I think that's a really special trait of Portland. That's also true of diners, where it's sort of like it means a lot to be a regular. That intimacy and that that community feeling that you get in a lot of Portland restaurants, that feels really special. I also feel like if we ever got a professional baseball team, we might be able to put some of that like wanting to identify with the team elsewhere. That's all. That's mm-hmm. what I think. One that's day. interesting. And I feel like you do end up identifying with certain restaurants. So you do start taking it personal. You're like, oh, you don't like that? I fucking love it. What's wrong yeah. with you? Yeah, I think that. And also there is, again, that element, I think, that it does feel cultural in Portland of being like you knew the place before it was cool. Yeah. Like that kind of feeling. I don't want to lean into the hipster stuff. That feels cliche. It's it's le- it's more along the lines of like, I'm a day one ride or die supporter of this thing. You right. know what I mean? I'm really into it. And I, I, I feel invested in it. Well, what were you able to do at Eater during your tenure that you're most proud of? Whew. Um, there was a package we did in 2021 on the state of coffee in Portland. And it was sort of like reflecting on the story of third wave coffee and, and specialty coffee that was told in the early 21st century. And then this sort of more contemporary story that was being told where there was a, an element of authorship and identity that that played into how we talk about coffee, um, almost like an antithesis to the like almost sterilized and predominantly white story of specialty coffee in the Pacific Northwest. So, you know, we talked about first generation and immigrant coffee roasters and coffee shop owners who had like cultural and background ties to countries that grow coffee and sort of how they incorporated their own relationship to that part of their heritage into their business. And it became this big sprawling thing talking about agricultural ethics and all this sort of stuff. It was it was a really fun project. So I think that comes to mind. But like on a like broader spectrum side of things, I think something I'm really proud of that we did at Eater Portland is we expanded the kind of stories that were being told here. Mm -hmm. We took on food as politics, food as policy, food as identity, food and climate. I think that the richness of the journalism that we did here and the way we used food as a lens to look at the city, I'm very proud of what we were able to do at Eater Portland considering, you know, the resources we had to do it. Yeah. You know, I was talking to John, our executive producer, about just a bit of like, you know, why do I feel sad that Brooke is leaving? Because it's not like Eater Portland is going to go away. And he just was like, you know, you can't tell what kind of city it is by just heat maps alone, you know, and Mm -hmm. you were able to definitely give somebody a feel for what Portland is and also where our values were and to give more voices a platform. It means a lot to hear you say that, I think, because... It was a goal I had at Eater Portland. It's a goal I'll take to Portland Monthly. Mm-hmm. And I think that that should be the goal of anyone who does like local beat reporting in some way is to be able to have the story that's told through their outlet be reflective of, of what's happening in a deeper sense. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else that you think that makes the Portland food scene unique? And do you think we might have the best food scene in the country? I set you up because you you can't yeah. say no now. But I mean, you can speak truthfully. <laughs> I think 
In terms of what makes Portland special, it's a, there are a lot of things. I think what we've talked about, yes, definitely plays a role, that, that collaborative sort of spirit. I think that we have a really good range and quality of like middle price point restaurants. Mm. So we don't have quite the same culture of like dollar slices, like the, the really sort of inexpensive food that you might see. And I would say like New York is a place that does that really well, LA. Um, and we don't have the really high price point stuff, which again, New York, LA, are, I think our most expensive tasting menu is $250 per person, which is still a lot, but is far less expensive than other major American cities. So I think that that is something that is sort of unique to us and special. The way Portland's licensing and like regulations are sort of structured allows for a certain level of cool culinary creativity. And I guess what I mean by that is that like the pricing of pop-ups, the sort of like licensing you need to do that is far lower cost than opening a restaurant. Um, For a long time, opening a food cart Mm. was far, far, far less expensive than opening a restaurant. So that lower barrier of entry allowed for a lot of chefs to take risks and for a lot of different types of chefs to try something out where they maybe wouldn't be able to do that in other cities. And so I think that's why we have such a thriving food cart culture. It's why we have such a thriving pop-up scene is that you have people who will come here specifically to do those things because they can, and they do stuff that they wouldn't feel like they could do in San Francisco, New York, Chicago. Mm -hmm. That's really special. Yeah. I think our city's emphasis on a really high quality of life also attracts some really talented chefs from other places. Um, And I've heard a lot of chefs say that the lack of presence of Michelin here, um, like the Michelin guide, that allows people a certain level of like the ability to relax. And when you don't have that same pressure, again, you have the opportunity to build better relationships with your dining clientele. It allows you to try things and do silly, cool stuff because you feel like it. I Mm -hmm. think that makes Portland really special. So quite a few things. Do I think it's the best food scene in the country? I think it's a tough one because how do you define best? The things I mentioned are things I find really special about Portland. There are things that Portland doesn't do quite as well. So like Korean barbecue, Mm -hmm. I I prioritize going in LA when I'm in LA because we don't have the the same scene. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do think that we have some of the best Vietnamese food in the country, some of the best Thai food in the country. Yeah. You know, I think that you nailed something that I could never articulate when I try to explain to people from out of town or why, you know, my partner and I, whenever we leave, why we're disappointed when we eat somewhere Mm -hmm. that's not Portland. And I think you just said it's the price point where we're always just like, you know, this would be so much better and cheaper in Portland. I don't understand why I'm paying double. Yeah. And that's like a thing I say over and I'm like, this is just not as good of a whatever as if Mm -hmm. I were eating in Portland. But it is. It's like this midpoint because it's true. Like I still can't get a good taco here. And I know there are people that are just like, what? But I can't. I'm sorry. When you're raised in a very like strong cultural landscape that just does that, it's just Mm kind of hard to find it somewhere else. But what Portland can do really well is that nice midpoint. Like you're going to have an amazing experience, a really wonderful meal, the freshest ingredients, and it's not going to cost. You're not going to walk out with like $300 less, you know? Yeah. Gosh, we didn't even talk about just the access to really incredible produce and growing season. Like that's a huge part of it as well, you know? And I think like there are things that just grow here just abundantly. I mean, it's, you know, the cliche of seasonality here, I think that comes from just a genuine cultural like citywide excitement over like the arrival of strawberries Mm -hmm. like people get psyched for strawberry season that are not food people and I think that's something that's special about Portland right Mm -hmm. it's true or like the cherries or the nectarines or like the produce you you say the farm that they're from Mm -hmm. oh it's this family's you know these are my nectarines these are the cherries I eat it's yeah it's it is pretty special that's a really interesting point you just brought up yeah because like people will be like you know oh, the bared peach line is wild today. You know what I mean? If you go to the farmer's market, I I noticed I had a such a niche conversation with my partner the other day where I was comparing strawberries from different farms. And I'm like, I think Pablo Munoz has the best strawberries this year. And like, <laughs> just this element of like, that is like <laughs> such a weird Portland conference. <laughs> and if you're like, 
Who is growing the best strawberries this season? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let's take a quick break here. And when we return, more with Brooke Jackson Glidden on Portland's food scene. Have you ever wished you could just go somewhere and decorate cakes? If you're nodding your head right now, well, Cake Hoopla has got you covered. A do-it-yourself cake and cupcake decorating studio in Tiger, they supply you with everything needed, including the baked cakes and cupcakes, and the frosting, the fondant, the sprinkles, tools, and even instructions if you're going for something a bit more highfalutin. You can join workshops, book private parties, or order kits to take home. No matter the skill level, Cake Hoopla has something for everyone. They even offer customizable packages for any kind of party. Kids' birthdays, company events, bridal showers, holiday parties, team building, you get it. Customers can also book a table, the party room, the whole studio, or just choose a pickup option. For more info, head over to Cake Hoopla in Tiger just off I-5 or go to cakehoopla.com. Well, all of this has been building up to what has been your all-time favorite meal on the job in Portland. <sighs> There are so, that's going to be such a tough one to answer. Oh my gosh, surprise, surprise. I think a few come to mind. I remember the first time I went to Long Bond, that was an incredibly special meal for me. It was back when it was at the potty space, so like back behind the bookshelf. I remember that. In that back room. Yeah. And I remember first having that myung sum with the shrimp and the, I think it was like pomelo jewels. It was just like such a perfect bite of food. It was the beginning of the meal. And I just remember it, I hadn't had Thai food like that before in my life. It just opened my eyes to a whole different world of Thai food. And it remains one of my all-time favorite restaurants. I am so happy that they won the James Beard this year. Mm -hmm. They really, really earned it. Long Bond is such a special restaurant. All the people who work there are really great. The servers, you know, the, everyone who is a part of that team is great. I would say honorable mention shocker. <laughs> My second meal at Berlou after Vince had sort of shifted it to the more Vietnamese centric menu. I remember mm -hmm. that was a really, really special meal. Again, doing things with food I'd never really encountered before. And my first meal at Republica when Lalo took over. Just such cool inventive stuff. And that, I think he was like 22, 23. And the executive chef of this restaurant um, exhibiting so much creativity. I would say those are two that come to mind. Yeah. Okay. Back to Burning Bridges. Which is your least favorite meal that you've Ooh. had in Portland? You don't have to say the restaurant, but you can maybe just say what has been your least favorite meal. Mm -hmm. For me, it would be something I paid way too much for. But like, I know you have yeah. better tastes. I have a lot, a lot come to mind. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, didn't you get like... Food poisoning. I was about to say, didn't you get food poisoning? I did. Um, I'm not going to name the restaurant. It's no longer open. Mm -hmm. But um, I was really excited about the opening of this restaurant. I went fairly early in their tenure and every dish was bad oh. um, down to the shrimp that I got sick off of. It was very expensive and some dishes were way over salted. Some were cooked with an inch of their life. The shrimp were old. Like it was just like everything went wrong and I kept trying to think of like one dish I liked and there just wasn't a single one recently at a restaurant that is open I think one of the worst things I've eaten or consumed recently was a foie gras cocktail oh no I thought it was gonna be like a foie wash which when canard opened they had a foie washed bourbon cocktail that was really delicious actually because uh -huh. it just added a little silkiness um and the, the, there's no foie in it it just you know, it was a part of the infusing process. This was blended. No. So the foie was blended. With alcohol? Yeah. Um, so it had like the texture of like an Adwala smoothie. No. It was really one of the foulest things I've ever consumed. That might be the foulest thing I've consumed on the job, maybe. Did you just have a sip and go, nope? I, I mean, it had like a medicinal flavor to it. I oh think there was like a cherry in oh it. Oh my God. Your face right now too. You're like reliving yeah. it. I'm so sorry. It was brutal. I can still remember it. And it was one of the only times ever in my life that like they came over and do, they were like, do you like your drink? And I was like, I, I don't. Like I, I, I cannot. I will not finish it. So yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I never send stuff back. I really don't. But I was like, I, I can't 
drink it. I mean, if you want to clear it, great. But like, I just, I, you know, mm-hmm. and they were like, do you want me to make it? Again? <laughs> no. <laughs> they were like, oh, that's so sad. They're like, no. maybe this one didn't, didn't go mm-hmm. well. Oh, buddy. No, yeah. that wasn't it. But also mm-hmm. like, one of them must have liked it, you know? Oh, that just sucks. I'm sure it was like a yeah. bummer for them too. Cause they're like, I tried so hard. Yeah. yeah that does sound no. kind of like unfortunate it doesn't sound like a good texture thing okay say that your next move takes you out of portland what would your Mm. last meal be such a good question i think i would probably go to roseville deli Mm -hmm. on a saturday and get cow lao i think it's like one of those consistently delicious meals that i always am like oh i'm so glad i ate this Mm -hmm. i think it's such a special thing you really can't find elsewhere um, it's such a like just at Vietnamese restaurants around the country. It's often hard to find cow lao on menus, and their version is so great. And I love that little restaurant. And I think it's kind of a perfect encapsulation of what I like about Portland dining: the that lack of uh, pretense and the dedication to making something that's really special and um, hard to find and delicious. Mm-hmm. It definitely is. Just the fact that they're like, "Sorry, you can only get it on Saturday." Like that's so Portland. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oop, missed it. Missed yeah. it. It's gone. Sorry, we only do it on Saturday. Well, before we wrap up, let's do a final round of honorable mentions because you <laughs> love honorable mentions. I do. This is just for our listeners. Give them three places they need to try this week. Oh, God. Okay. I wish you could see her face. It totally looks like she's in pain. Yeah, because there's <laughs> there's like bucket list. Like yeah. if you haven't been here yet, you have to go. Well, just to like do one okay. bucket list and then two like y- you That's know right. the reason okay. we said honorable mentions is because we know we're just like look, you're gonna give us three. I know you I are. Am. I so. am. Okay, so we're gonna do one is like bucket list restaurant, a place that everyone should go. Um, I really think Kachka is special. Mm-hmm. It's again one of those restaurants where it's like it's very specific to here. And if you haven't been yet, I really do think it's worth going. Um, the last time I was there was like better than many meals I'd had in recent history. So I think Kachka, if you haven't been, you should go to Kachka. And get the horseradish vodka. There you go. Oh, you gotta. Okay. In terms of a restaurant that is underrated, I'm going to say Gracie's, a pizza in St. John's. You just always see like the neighborhood there in a way that feels really special. And the food is really great. And, you know, there's a lot of great pizza in Portland. You can go to Lovelies and go to a lot of places. This is, I think this is a spot where it's like, if I don't want to think about where I'm going for dinner on a Friday, I go to Gracie's. Mm -hmm. And my third, I'm going to have be the place I wrote about last. The last piece I wrote for Eater Portland was about Urdaneta. I think it's a restaurant that has matured a ton since my first meal there. It was always good in my opinion, I think it became really great. And I think that had a lot to do with the Contreras were constantly going back to Spain Mm -hmm. to try new things and to grow and to challenge themselves. And I went there. um, It was my last like paid for by eater meal. (laughs) So, and I went when I first started, like a few months after I first started as well. And it was a night and day thing between that meal and this meal. The food was so special. What we drank, all the vermouths, the wine, all really fantastic. The service was really great. It feels special occasion-y to me, Mm -hmm. but it is always busy. At Mm -hmm. least, you know, it was a Wednesday night and it was packed. And like, I think that energy, it reminds me of Spain. Mm -hmm. And I think that people keep going back there because of the level of service. You know, you have some really friendly people who've been working there for years and years. And I think they have that nice balance of taking risks, doing things, you know, things that are challenging and retaining really loyal regulars. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's hard to pull off. Yeah. I haven't been back since I accidentally ordered your expensive steak. Ordered a hundred and twenty six dollars <laughs> steak because it was so loud. <laughs> it was also it was it was Valentine's Day, right? Yeah, no, no, it wasn't Valentine's yeah. Day. It was it was my partner's and I's like eleventh anniversary, um, and it was yeah, and we just went and we couldn't. We it was so loud. It was so, and we were inside because it was like you know kind of cold out. <laughs> Yeah, heard twenty six dollars yeah. because you know, like they're small plates. Yeah, hundred and twenty six was is not <laughs> what you would expect for any of the plates. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, did it feel large format when you got it? Well, once we got it, we're just like, wow, that's a really good deal for twenty six dollars. 
dollars. No. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> but you know what? We had such a wonderful experience. Definitely would go back there. I'm just, it's just always stung a little, you know? Yeah. I'm just like, oh God. Yeah. Um, this is actually from our executive producer. He <laughs> wonders what you think about a, a restaurant trying to sell a seafood tower, but it comes out and it's just a platter. <gasps> this is a really fun nitpicky opinion. Okay. Um, where it's sort of like, don't call it an X if it isn't an X. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Don't call it smoked salmon if it's steelhead. That's trout. Yeah. It's good, but it's not the same thing. Yeah. You should not use the term tower if it isn't a tower. Mm -hmm. So I do think saying a seafood platter, a raw bar um, sampler. A plate of seafood, you know? Yeah. Just but I do think there is something that feels very triumphant and special. About elevated. Literally elevated. Yeah. Yes. I can understand that annoyance. I, it's not my annoyance, but I understand it. You wouldn't be disappointed if you ordered a seafood tower and out came a platter? I haven't lived it. I need to live it. I'm poor. Uh, <laughs> Here's a deal. I get, I get a couple shrimp. I You're like, I buy, a shri I buy shrimp. I buy shrimp. <laughs> I go get dollar oysters. That's You're like, I, I buy do. a seafood cup. <laughs> I think, I do think I would be annoyed. It feels fresher somehow. <laughs> it's in, it's a, in tower. a tower? Like, there's something about, like, the ice or, yeah. like, the uh -huh. airflow. I don't know. It, it needs to be there. airborne. Yeah. I yeah. don't know. I don't know. But the it's, like, airflow. <laughs> I don't know, Claudia. I just feel like there's something about that that I think is important. Oh, man. Well, Brooke, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thank you so much for being on the show. You were, like, our first contributor. Is that true? Yeah. That's wild. I know. And now we don't know when we're going to see you again. It's so sad. I'm, I'm basically dying. <laughs> <laughs> don't exist in Portland. I just love it. We're just making such a big deal. And like next month, it's like, Brooke on this. Like, <laughs> Who knows? I mean, you know, editor in chief, I feel like I'd probably send a writer before I'd send myself. But I don't know. Maybe I'll lurk. Like, there might be a story that's worth talking about. <laughs> Well, you should be really proud of your tenure at Eater Portland. I know it's a group effort, but you really did give our area a really special voice. So thank you for doing that. Thank you so much, Claudia. That's all for today here on CityCast Portland. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with a friend, rate or leave us a review. It really does help us out. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's. <laughs>